talked about the general fundamentals of the GST law. We talked about its impact on the procurement cycle. Lots of things which we talked about in the procurement cycle will replicate itself in the sales cycle. So I'm not going to again go in a repetitive manner. But we'll take up some newer, newer issues which are centric to the sale aspect of this entire story when we go to the sales processes. So let's uh, go into the impact of GST on sale of goods and services. And I think the uh, most major impact of uh, GST on the sale and services is going to be the fact of dual GST. And again, we'll revisit the first slide which we talked about, the fact that you have a dual GST concept which requires you to have a state-specific registration and payment of taxes at a state level. The concept of CGST, SGST and IGST, intrastate versus interstate supply and the factor of deciding what is intrastate versus interstate. And as we have understood it, the factor for deciding that would be the location from where you make the supply, which we will say is the location of supplier, LOS, and the place to which the supply is made, which is known as the POS, place of supply. So the first variable is service provider or warehouse centric. The second variable is generally the buyer centric or the client centric. And a combination of these two will decide how and when, where you are going to pay the tax. And that's where there's a fundamental difference between a single locational establishment and multiple locational establishment. To give you an example, through an IGST concept, ultimately the tax flows into the destination. But that does not give an organization a liberty or a flexibility to bill from anywhere. And this is one important mindset change which will be required as far as the service providers are concerned. To cite an example, if I have a warehouse in Gujarat and I am supplying goods from Gujarat to a client in Gujarat, it will have to be CGST and SGST from Gujarat. I cannot say that my corporate office is in Bombay and I will do IGST and pass on the tax, pay the tax in Maharashtra and pass on the tax in to the customer in Gujarat. Therefore, IGST is not in a way a convenience. Product companies understand this very beautifully. But when it comes to service companies, even yesterday I was in one of the client implementations assignments. It's difficult to, you know, uh, explain this and it needs some time for service establishments to get these things settled. You have a branch from where actually the supply is being made. Today, because of centralized registration, you invoice everything from head office in Mumbai. Come GST, you cannot bill from Mumbai. You will have to bill from the location from where you are making a supply. And it's equivalent to that just because you are doing IGST and it gives you the, it does not give you the flexibility to really say that I will bill from Mumbai and give IGST and pass on the taxes to the respective states. Therefore, both these aspects are important, location of supplier and the place of supply. And that's where single versus multi-locational uh, establishment might see different answers coming out on this matrix. And we, through some examples and diagrams, we'll try to understand this well. And we'll look at the impact pre-GST and post-GST for various types of organizations. We'll start with a most simplest model, a single locational product establishment. You have a factory or a uh, warehouse in one state, you might have customers in the same state, you might have customers in different states. So what you do today is for customers in the same state, you sell against VAT. For customers in different states, you sell it against CST. Come GST, life remains the same. You still will have one registration. Earlier you had a one VAT registration. Now that VAT registration gets migrated to GST registration. For customers within the same state, you will build C plus SGST. For customers in different states, you will build IGST and pass on the credits to the respective state. Especially for this type of a organization, life really does not change too much. Only some positives are, there's much lesser dependence on documents like C form, F form, etc. Because all your supplies would be against IGST and there will be a tax payment. Because you will be paying taxes on output side which you will be recovering from the customer, all your credits will get burnt out and therefore you will not end up with refund scenarios. Of course, many exemptions which are available today might go away. Ultimately, you'll be collecting taxes from the customers. Only thing which you need to look at is the place of supply, especially in case of build to ship to arrangements. So if you have build to at one address, ship to at another address, then perhaps the build to address will have a prominence and the tax liability will be decided basis the build to instead basis the ship to as it is happening today. Of course, 
if goods are not shipped at all there's a big challenge which is coming because the way the raw is drafted there could be a challenge in case of deliveries which are happening across the counter so you could have a scenario that i am supplying the goods at my factory gate delivering the goods across the counter and then the buyer arranges for his transportation and i am not responsible for any activity related to transportation as of today this transaction is still treated as an interstate supply if the buyer is from another state because today the cst act uses the word the sale causes movement of goods but when we come to the gst law the words used in the gst law are the supply involves movement of goods now there's a distinction between the word sale causes movement and supply involves movement and therefore if i am supplying at my factory gate my entire risk responsibility everything gets over at the supply at the my factory gate and a subsequent movement i am not in any way concerned with a subsequent movement in that case the transaction becomes a local supply i will not be able to do igst and therefore if i charge local c plus s gst and if the buyer is from another state you might end up in a scenario of a loss of credit if you have these types of models of x factory sales x works sales it's important that you analyze the documents specifically the transport documents and thereafter take a call whether you are uh, impacted because of this if yes maybe take a position of realigning your terms and making sure that the credits flow smoothly because if it's interstate supply through igst the credits will flow if it's a local supply because that buyer is in another state he may not have a, a registration in the first state and therefore you can have a problem same problem you can have at a procurement level also so even in procurement if there are these types of transactions please find out a solution to this talk to the vendors and ask them how are they planning to interpret this section and whether they are going to treat x works supplies as igst or are they going to treat it as c plus s gst so that is one important area which one will have to look at uh, on this aspect way bills of course is going to create a challenge and we'll have to really synchronize the way bill process in this entire aspect sometimes if your products are moving at exhibitions in different states and there are supplies from those states there will be a need for a casual taxpayer registration in that state because the final supply happens at the exhibition hall in the another state so that is where again a casual taxpayer registration concept might come into play so that is what we'll have to look at as far as the single product establishment is concerned as far as a multi product establishment is concerned an entity having establishments across multiple states uh i think uh, life today also is multiple registrations they would be having in each of the states where they have branches or warehouses that continues the way it is the vat registrations get migrated into gst and of course if there are inter movements today it's against f form one there is no tax that gets substituted by igst because now interstate brand transfers would be liable for taxation and that's where we'll just touch upon a little bit on the valuation aspect of interstate branch transfers they have defined valuation rules and if you go through the valuation rules they have given the rules of priority they start by saying that all these branch transfers should be valued at open market value or if open market value is not feasible you'll have to pick up a similar market value of like goods from for a third party transaction if both of this is not available then you can go by the cost plus method and they have defined 110% of cost as one method next is they say that if i ship goods from one state to another and from the another state the goods are ultimately sold you can start with the resale price the final price and take 90% of the final price as the branch transfer value and thereafter that last proviso which says that if the receiving branch is entitled for full credit the value plotted by you in the invoice will be acceptable now essentially therefore you end up with four or five matrices we typically anchor point around 110% of cost or something like that now when you are looking at this type of a matrix the situation which comes in uh, systems is that your systems and your accounting parlance is the inventory has to be valued at cost you might be moving from one branch to another the gst law might require you to pay a tax on 110% but your cost of inventory is only 100 and if you are going to generate an invoice because you will have to create a branch transfer invoice it will be at 110 necessarily it will be accounted in the receiving branch at 110 so your inventory valuation goes up now naturally you are not earned a profit just by sending goods from warehouse in maharashtra to warehouse in gujarat you don't earn a profit if your inventory value goes up you will necessarily have to create a secondary provision and say that this is a provision for embedded profit within a 
notional branch transfer because of GST. So that associated accounting impact will have to be taken into account because your AS2, your accounting principles will still require that this inventory till the time it is not finally sold to the end customer should always continue to be valued at cost which is 100. So there will be a need for creating provisions. Second issue is the value also will keep on cumulative. And we have a scenario, let's say, uh, it's a live example which we were looking at, wherein the same product moved from one location to another location, back to a third location, then a fourth location. Now, if at each stage I have to add 10% of the cost, and when you say cost, it's not only the raw material cost, but also the embedded logistics and the freight cost. You are ending up that the same product of 100 rupee value, when it goes through four warehouses, it ends in a value of 140 to 150 rupees. Now, essentially, the inherent value of the product is the same. So your systems cannot at the same time have a product which is valued at 100 at one location and 140 at another location. Because then it's an overall a control issue and uh, that is where again we see some challenges which are coming up in implementing this entire piece of legislation especially from a systems perspective. More importantly, when you're looking at capital goods and collaterals and other aspects, how are we going to value them? More important than value, before valuation comes the issue of identification. Because in most of the organizations, fixed assets uh, registers are maintained distinctly, separately, and they are not integrated into your inventory and logistic system. So if there are frequent movement of capital assets from one location to another, how are we going to identify that? How are we going to bring that into our financial systems? And then plot a value for those fixed assets Please understand that those fixed assets can be of different points of time, can have dep different depreciated values as per books of accounts and maybe the serial number of the product might have lost identification in the block of assets which appears in your financial records. So there are challenges in identifying these capital assets as well as valuing them. Maybe because of this proviso, what you can do is you can notionally identify some value and say irrespective of the aging of the asset. I will pick up this value and so long as that uh, value is on an average basis coming out to be a fair value according to me that should be acceptable but yes these are some problems which people will have to grapple with when we go into implementing this aspect of branch transfer taxation vis-a-vis -vis capital goods collaterals collaterals also you have so much of diaries and calendars and you know the application forms brochures which keep on moving from one state to another now necessarily these are self-consumption items. So if I have to load 10% at cost, say that my cost of purchase of a printing and stationary material is 100 and add 10 rupees to that and then again charge GST, it's going to be a little bit uh, cumbersome type of an exercise. End of the day, plus minus, and therefore many people are living with it, but yes, there are challenges on this front of branch transfers vis-a-vis -vis the entire inventory module which we are looking at. That takes me to the service establishments and this is where as I was highlighting there is a lot of process change which is coming. As of today as far as a single locational establishment is concerned they had a single service tax registration. They used to pay service tax moving forward they will pay CGST, SGST or IGST. Because the registration is going to be common the service tax number gets replaced by the GST number. One number for uh, interstate clients he will bill IGST because he is still supplying the service from a central office in one location. Up to here, life is simple. Problems start when this establishment was multi-locational. So moment you have three branches, today they had a comfort of raising invoices from one location and paying tax at one location. Moving forward, this will result in multiple registrations and payment of taxes at each of the specific locations. And uh, necessarily, the tax discharges and the st uh, state level trial balance and all those issues will start. Up to here it's okay, it's still straight jacket, you still live with a pain of a common regi uh, multiple registrations and multiple records. The issue of uh, ob subjectivity comes in the next uh, area where we are going to talk about services where there is a joint effort by multiple locations in rendering a service. And that's very common in case of services because typically services are intangible. Let's say a chartered accountant firm itself, they can have three locations and partial work can be done from one location, partial work done from another location and maybe all the three branches jointly render efforts and ultimately render a service to a client. It is very common in advertisement sector, it is very common across banks, 
we are where the server might be in one location the transacting operational teams might be in another location software companies it's very common so in many cases there are multiple locations which jointly work to provide a experience to a client to a, provide a service to a client how do you decide from where should i build how do you decide the location of the supplier and that is something which is fairly subjective because when this is the example which we are trying to bring about that in this example if you look at it's a joint service which is rendered by mumbai delhi and chennai three all the three units jointly render service to a client located in mumbai in this type of a situation the question which comes is which of them should bill and i think the answers to this are two fold are uh, two broad options depending on the type of the sector if it is possible you can look at decentralized billing something like a courier agency you might have a single rate contract with a courier agency to pick up consignments from 10 different locations and transport it to different different locations here the revenue is basis the number of consignments picked up from each location so if a courier company wants it can choose to say that i will bill for all consignments picked up from gujarat separately and all consignments picked up from rajasthan separately all consignments picked up from karnataka separately so in that type of a scenario it is possible to resolve this joint provision of service through a decentralized or a split billing approach but if you are looking at an chartered accountant three of them are jointly rendering an audit service and there's a common fee for that service so it may not be possible because the supply itself is singular it is not multiple instances of supplies aggregated into a single document therefore a software developer a chartered accountant and advertising agency for them it will be difficult to really split invoices in that type of a scenario the law says that you should bill from the establishment most directly concerned with the supply now how to interpret the establishment most directly concerned with the supply is a subject matter of interpretation and whatever you take the officers are likely to take a different position so it's a fairly subjective game but international precedents would suggest that while multiple factors will decide this a primary factor might be the contracting establishment the establishment which was front ending with the client was entering into the purchase order the engagement letters might perhaps be the most important uh, establishment so what you might need to do in that type of a scenario is within these three identify one of the establishments which is most directly concerned with the supply bill to the client from that location that by itself doesn't mean that the other establishments did not render any supplies the other establishments can then be said to have provided a back end or a support supply or a support service to the front ending entity so in this example we are saying mumbai becomes a front ending entity because it has entered into an engagement letter with the client so to the client the bill will go from mumbai but as far as delhi and chennai is concerned both of them are helping mumbai in provide this service and therefore there will be a branch transfer of a service from delhi and chennai to mumbai there will have to be a notional valuation for this again will go by the cost plus 10% markup principle uh, raise an invoice internally pay taxes in delhi and chennai and claim the credit in mumbai and therefore each of the three jurisdictions is safeguarded each of the three jurisdictions you are paying a tax so none of them can question you that look i see a lot of activity in this state but i am not registered in this state or i am not paying taxes in that state so this is how one will have to operationalize scenarios of joint provision of services when you do this you will also find attendant issues of imbalance of credits you might have a scenario that i am billing from one state but the cost for that transaction is sitting in some another state necessarily in this case there will have to be a branch transfer of expense because the state where the expenditure is incurred is incurred for another state which is earning a revenue and a very common example which i can give is in a case of a broker who might earn a transaction charge or a brokerage revenue in 30 states but for earning this revenue they have taken a license from the stock exchange and the fees charged by the exchange are billed centrally at one location in this type of a scenario necessarily there is an expense relating to a transaction which is concentrated in one state but the incomes are diversified into 30 different states so there will be a need for a branch transfer of expense 
you can have many examples and the classic example which we always give is shared common overheads which are at the corporate level so you can have audit fees you can have rent of the corporate building you can have a research wing and you might have four factories which use the benefits of the research done by the corporate research team in all these cases there will be a branch transfer or a supply of service by the corporate to each of the branches and each of these aspects will have to be analyzed your P&L will have to be analyzed from each expense perspective especially if you are multi-locational and then operationalize this branch transfer concept vis-a-vis -vis those types of transactions when we are looking at uh, sales we also have to look at the applicability of the correct rate and that's where we re revisit the rates which we talked about in the first half ranging from 0 to 28 percent and assess at this juncture we need to touch upon the concept of interpretation so while we say it's a goods and services tax lots of provisions for goods are distinct from provisions for services a very simplistic example is that in case of goods the invoice has to accompany the goods or before it you cannot bill after the supply of the goods but as far as services is concerned you have a 30 day period post the completion where you can raise an invoice so even the time of supply the place of supply rules where goods will be following the ship to model whereas in case of services it's going to be the address of the client on record many places you will see that the rules are distinct and that's where it comes to understanding the distinction between a supply of goods and a supply of services we are told goods are all types of tangible movable assets of course in the first draft they had talked about tangibility now they have not talking too much about tangibility which results in some challenges in interpretation of software whether software would constitute goods supply of goods or whether it would constitute of supply of services depending on the type of the transaction i would believe unless it is a shrink wrapped software on a cd which would constitute goods otherwise in if it's merely a grant of a license it would fall into a service category so that is the first area where you have to classify the transaction as goods and services one important thing to note is the classification of goods is very restrictive it contains only a simplistic scenario of transfer of ownership of goods either today or in future whereas most of the other examples are classified as services including examples of deemed sales like works contracts or leases or IP transactions or licenses all the deemed sales are now reclassified as services and this will have an implication because the classification your interpretation of SSE code all of those things will depend on classification of goods as tra of transaction as goods or as services that is as far as a single supply is concerned moment you have multiple supplies in a single rate there is a question of what is the GST rate which will be applicable you might be let us say supplying uh, selling goods along with the sale of goods you are also transporting the goods and the question which comes is uh, for the product there is an 18 percent rate and for transportation there is a five percent rate so which, which rate will i apply and to address this issue we have to first examine whether this is a composite supply or a mixed supply what we are told is if there are multiple things within the same supply find out the principal supply what is the principal predominant supply is there something in this example when I'm supplying goods and also transporting the goods the principal dominant intention in this transaction is the supply of goods therefore it is a composite supply where there is one principal supply if the principal supply attracts 18 percent the entire transaction will attract 18 percent this is the analysis of composite supply in a composite supply there is one important supply everything else is a means to effectuate that first important supply as compared to that you have mixed supplies so let and, and they've given an example wherein you pack uh, let's say uh, dry fruits along with chocolates and maybe some uh, other product now the question is there are three products within the same box which of them is important unlike the first example where I could easily say sale of the product is important than transportation here I cannot define any of these dry fruits chocolates and maybe some uh, raisins and I cannot define any of these three as being a principal supply and therefore they say this is a mixed supply in case of mixed supply we are told look at each product find out each products rate and whichever product has the highest rate please apply that rate so in this example if you have chocolates which are at 28 percent even if dry fruits are at 12 or 18 you will still end up paying 28% on the entire box because you have some chocolates within that process. 
So that is how you will have to interpret mixed supplies versus composite supplies. You might need to look at each of your deliverables, identify whether they are composite supplies, mixed supplies. If they are mixed supplies, see whether there is a need to reclassify the contract, divide the contracts, have multiple split contracts and treat them individually. If you don't do that, you might end up with paying a higher rate of tax even for exempted or low rated items. So that is one important care which one will have to be taking when we are looking at this concept of principal versus uh, composite versus mixed supplies. And of course, uh, there is one interesting uh, provision which uh, of course talks about classification of the service uh, services into different service accounting codes. Unluckily, initially the guidance given to the trade was that the service accounting codes will be the same accounting codes which are uh, uh, currently in vogue under the service tax law. But uh, when the GST council finally floated the rates, we were on for a surprise because what they have done is they have now picked up the international classification of services. So the original codes which we were picking up from the service accounting codes of the service tax law are no longer valid. You will have to pick up the new Excel document which is floating around on the internet nowadays which is the international classification of services. And each of your transactions will have to be split basis that type of a classification and you will have to pick up a service accounting code from there. It's a fairly detailed code as compared to the current code where like for example in the current code we have construction service as one entry. But when you go to this uh, service accounting codes you will find that construction has at least 20 service accounting codes depending on the type of the construction which you undertake. So the service accounting code for construction of a power plant will be different from a construction uh, service accounting code for a construction of a metro project. And that is where one will have to be careful about picking up the right service accounting codes in each of those cases. So that exercise needs to be done and in each of the transactions your operational teams will have to chip into it and explain what is the type of the product which is being sold uh, like for example job work. In job work also there are different types of manufacturing services which have been listed and depending on the type of the job work which you undertake your service accounting code will change. Here one more aspect which we are told is while generally services will have a defined hard coded rate for services which are in the nature of a transfer of a right to use goods, we are told the underlying rate of the goods will apply. So for example, if air conditioners are liable for 28% and you are not selling air conditioner but you are only hiring an air conditioner, then the GST rate for hiring of air conditioners also will be 28%. You cannot say that I am providing only a service, therefore please classify it as 18 so especially where you are dealing with activities where there are capital equipments classified under 28 percent basket you have to be a bit careful about what that constituent is and maybe the same question what is the GST rate on higher charges I might answer in five different angles if it's an exempted asset which is being hired it will be zero percent and if it's an air conditioner it might be 28 and if it's a generic product it might be 18 so depending on the type of the asset which is being hired the underlying uh, goods which are being hired the rate of tax will keep on varying so that is an important aspect which you need to bear in mind. That takes me to the next aspect of credit notes and debit notes as we were highlighting credit notes, debit notes, invoices. The flow of data on the GST system is all supplier centric and therefore just like invoices have to be uploaded by the supplier and you only match them and accept, reject or modify them. Same way the credit notes will have to be uploaded by the supplier and you will be doing matching and mismatching of it. Today credit note debit notes are issued both by supplier and customer and depending on who issues the name keeps on changing. So today you might have a scenario that the supplier issues a credit note and you in your records for your own purposes issue a debit note and issue it to him or the other way around. When a supplier issues a debit note you issue a credit note. Now only the supplier's documents will be taken into account. As a customer, your documents may not have any relevance. And this is where one will have to also look at a scenario where the credit note is issued and he claims a reduction in the output tax that has to be correspondingly matched by a reduction in the input tax credit by the recipient. And I took that numerical example earlier to explain this. Please note that these credit note adjustments are permitted only up to the September of the next financial year and not only credit notes, any of the adjustments which we are talking about in terms of rectification of entries, everything 
the entire financial year had closes itself on the 30th september of the next year any adjustments for financial year 17 18 for example will have to be completed by 30th of september uh, of the next financial year so that is how one will have to be careful we understand in some cases the entire eligibility for discount is decided at the end of the year depending on the volume of tech of the year in april may june the person decides that this is the amount of the uh, uh, you know the discount which is entitled in those types of scenarios there can be challenges in really interpreting and identifying the credit note and making sure that it happens by the 30th of the next year and of course the interpretation of pre supply versus post supply discount basis the agreement is going to be the key on understanding whether the discounts on credit note will attract gst or not attract gst as far as free supplies is concerned the first draft law presented a lot of challenges because there there was an abstract provision which said all free supplies are taxable the final law luckily wisdom prevailed and uh, free supplies to unrelated parties are not taxable i understand uh, even today when i keep on speaking at forums uh, people uh, look at timed data and in the older versions lots of commentary is available on the internet only challenge is when a, anybody prepares an article including me we generally do not put an expiry date to that article so today also if you find some of an older recording of my uh, uh, youtube video of june or july you might hear me to say free supplies are taxable but today in this forum i am saying that free supplies are not taxable it was a timed version the latest version clearly says free supplies are not taxable only tax implications arises if the free supply is to a related person or to your own branches otherwise there is no tax on anything which is given free to an unrelated party but that's not the end of it please note that anything which you supply free there is a requirement of a corresponding input tax credit reversal so if you bought something at 100 rupees and you are giving it free you claimed the credit of 18 rupees that 18 rupees of credit which you have claimed has to be reversed and given back to the government and this will impact you in all your sales promotion activities many companies buy products for gifts and for sales promotion and that is where the input credit tax credit reversals is something which one will have to be a little bit careful about also one more aspect is many a times while companies say that these are free supplies essentially if you deep dive into the transaction you will realize that these are more in the nature of barters or exchanges rather than free supplies and if there are barters and exchanges please note that the definition of supply specifically includes barters and exchanges and the definition of consideration includes a non monetary consideration so uh, you might have scenarios where there are exchanges but reworded as free supplies you have to be fairly careful because while most businesses say that these are free supplies we all understand that in businesses there are no free lunches so that is where one will have to deep dive into this and see whether they are really in the nature of barters or there is some uh, tax issue attached to that in case of free supplies advances is one more area where of course services uh, there was already a tax on advance goods there was no tax so firstly the tax implication does come in and more importantly in both the cases there's a detailed uh, uploading requirement which is coming in so while there is a liability to pay a gst at the time of receipt of advance you are also required to support that receipt through a formal document known as receipt voucher there is a defined uh, context to it and you have to contain and that receipt voucher has to contain some minimum document uh, re requirements and it has to be serially numbered it has to uh, and after issuing the receipt voucher when the actual provision of service happens you have to issue an invoice the up, uh, you, while you pay the tax at the time of the receipt voucher the uploading process is a little bit different for invoices raised for this receipt vouchers and therefore the gstr1 process flow will have to be fairly understood to take care of this treatment of advances so that is one area where you see a little bit of a challenge because if you receive an advance in the same month and invoice is raised in the same month there's a different process if you receive an advance in a particular month invoice raised in the second month there's a different process and that that's where we see lots of it related challenges because when you receive an advance the it system doesn't understand whether you are going to raise the invoice in the same month or you are not going to raise the invoice so we find lots of manual interventions which might be required on this front as far as the receiver is concerned the supplier paid the gst at the time of advance but the receiver will be eligible for credit only on the time of receipt of service and the invoice and therefore it's actually a cash flow issue government enjoys the float of the uh, gst which is paid on the advance one derivative question which regularly keeps on coming is you require me to pay tax on advance in service tax it was okay it was a single tax so whatever advance i received i paid 15% at one location 
but in GST you want to tell, uh, there are five rates for more importantly the I don't know whether the buyer is going to be interstate or intrastate so it could be CGST IGST or SGST we don't know what tax will apply and uh, rate will apply so how do I discharge GST on this when government was presented this problem and this was one of the reasons why industry told the government that look this is the problem why do you want a tax on advance it is complicating things too much let the tax be only on invoicing government uh, understood the problem they didn't remove the problem they said that we give you a concession and what is that concession they said that if you don't know whether it is CGST, SGST, IGST anything and you don't know the tax rate do one thing you right now pay me IGST at 18% and later on when you realize the actual thing you adjust it so that's even more complicated so there is a proviso now in the revised uh, rules wherein they are saying that if the nature or the rate of supply is not known then you will be required to pay IGST at 18 percent so again maybe your products itself are at 5 percent bracket and then if you pay 18 and then claim an adjustment it's going to be a reasonably complicated game to go ahead on that front so advances is something which is a little bit tricky and that's where I come back to my initial discussion of treatment of advances versus deposits and wherever possible if you are able to realign to deposits or reduce the time lag between advances and your actual invoicing it might help because at a procedural level this is going to really complicate your entire IT network that takes me to exports as far as export of services is concerned there are five cumulative conditions the place of supply being outside India and therefore the pain of intermediary services so today you have many intermediaries in India who receive commission for marketing goods of foreign companies and while initially it was treated as an export in 2014 they amended the law and uh, required all these uh, commissions received from abroad was made liable for service tax and that liability continues in GST intermediaries will continue to pay GST even if they receive commission from abroad same way depending on the type of the activity which you do you will have to look at the place of supply and accordingly see whether the place of supply is actually outside India you also have to make sure that you receive the money in convertible foreign exchange and the transaction is not within the same entity meaning not a reimbursement from a branch of your own so in that case uh, export benefit is not available otherwise yes export of services are zero rated and there's no applicability of tax on that as far as export of goods is concerned it means it's where the definition has been picked up from the customs law which basically means crossing of the customs frontier and taking the goods outside India from a place within India and uh, as I was highlighting earlier the concept of penultimate exports is no longer there if you are supplying to an exporter you will still need to pay the tax as far as export of goods services along with that we also have the concept of SEZs where we are told supplies to and by SEZs will be zero rated so all supplies which are made to two uh, to SEZ units and developers there will not be any tax now zero rating is operationalized to through uh, two mechanisms the first mechanism is bonding and you don't pay any duty at all and claim the credits and the second mechanism is you pay the duty and then claim a refund now the similar to the current process under excise where you can rebate under bond or you can rebate on payment of excise duty and uh, get back a rebate claim similar process is continued under GST for goods I think the same ARE one concept will continue as far as services are concerned they will define some document and for SEZs also they will have to define a document and then we'll have to see what documents they define and we'll have to make sure that we have those documents to claim an upfront exemption otherwise we'll have to pay and claim a rebate of course there's a refund mechanism and they are saying that will give you 95 percent refund within five working days and all those things they are saying all of the I think the proof of the pudding will lie in the eating and of course any day I would prefer an outright exemption over paying and refund so we'll have to just see how that entire thing what are the types of documents which come out on this regard and accordingly one will have to take a position now that sales your entire transactions will ultimately have to move into the GST and that's where this stratification of your turnover becomes very very important and as I was highlighting because of the requirement of an online matching of credit the entire GST uploading your entire return is divided into different baskets and tables and what are those uh, requirements is you have to firstly divide your entire turnover into these many baskets and what are those baskets whatever other taxable transactions get divided into B2B and B2C B2B is wherever your customer has a registration number B2C is where your customers don't have a registration number within B2C it further gets classified into B2C large and B2C small B2C large is one invoice having about two and a half lakhs B2C small is everything else now what you are told is for B2B and B2C large 
you have to upload line level data in b2c large you have to upload the name of the customer also along with the sale information for b2c small you will just upload an aggregate data or total figure but when you are uploading a total figure you will have to upload it vis-a-vis -vis hsn and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the place of supply so assuming you are a single product company you might still have customers in 30 states and in that case your upload of b2c small will get divided into 30 figures total sale for the customers in maharashtra total sales for customers in gujarat and so on and so forth if you have multiple products or multiple services this will get further multiplied depending on the hsn and the sse classification so that is the first three baskets wherein we talk about b2b and b2c Thereafter, any amendments to that by way of a debit note or a credit note, again issued as a supplier. Debit note for a rate increase, credit note for a rate reduction will come into this basket. Thereafter, you will have rectifications of transactions of earlier months. You will have exports, nil rated supplies, all of this will also be mentioned. And finally, advances received and adjustments thereof. All of this will be uploaded for a particular month. Amendments to earlier months data will also be uploaded into this. And the total of all of this along with the adjustments of the amendments becomes my GST turnover for that month. Now this is where reconciliation becomes very complex because you are looking at a very dynamic set of transactions. If you look at the left hand side, the total of maybe the first five uh, except the advances will be something which is coming from your revenue. But in this month, if I rectify a last month's turnover, it will also reflect in this month's return. But in my financials, it is there in the last month. So I have to be very careful when I'm structuring a reconciliation format between my financials and between what is uploaded on the GST network. There can be a fundamental difference in these values and all the more complication comes because in financials you do not recognize branch transfers as revenues. Whereas in GST R1, branch transfers will also be recognized as revenues. Bring in AS9 and then you have a complication and a recipe for disaster because you have a revenue recognition, you have something called unbuilt revenue, you have prepaid revenue and when you bring all of that, you really will find that it's not going to be a very simple game to say that I have raised 10 invoices, I have paid tax on 10 invoices and that's the end of it. It might be much more complex than what it appears on the piece of uh, record. That takes me to the documentation on the sales side which I might need to issue and as, uh, as you can see there's, there are fundamentally number of quite a few number of documents which will be required. At one point of time there's a discussion that when you are looking at everything all credits through the GST network, what is the requirement for so much documents to be issued? The government says yes uh, these documents would still be required, the old habits die hard and therefore there's a, a in fact a very detailed verbios on each of these documents to be issued. So we have tax uh, invoices to be issued for all in uh, transactions of taxable goods as well as taxable services. Thereafter we have bill of supply for exempted goods and services. Please note that you are for exempted activities you are not permitted to issue a tax invoice. Each of them has to be serially numbered separately. So if you are having some exempted activity as well as taxable activity, two separate sets of documents will be required. And if you have a common POS software, it will be a nightmare because uh, each of them will have a different format and you have to make sure that you know uh, the first person comes up and buys something which is taxable. The second person comes and buys something which is exempted and your format in the POS might change to some extent because of this. If you receive advances, you have to issue a receipt voucher and invoice will be issued when the uh, advance is adjusted against the actual activity. If you refund the money back, then you have to issue a refund voucher. So that is one more document which will come into place and thereafter you have debit notes, credit notes and supplementary tax invoices for subsequent adjustments of the transactions. So all of these types of transaction documents will have to be issued and each of them has a very specific format. There's a detailed uh, rule which has been issued of what all each of these documents should contain and as far as tax invoice is concerned, one important thing is the invoice numbering format which I was just highlighting in the earlier part for the matching. Here they have given the code of how the invoice number should look like. They have said that it can contain alphanumeric characters only. It can contain a slash and a dash. No other character is allowed like an underscore, space, etc. is not allowed. It cannot exceed 16 digits in length. And uh, it has to be serially numbered. It can have a series. And of course serial numbering is vis-a-vis -vis each of the states. So at one stage you might just need to sit on a piece of paper and actually plot how you want to create your invoice numbering logic. 
because there will be n number of things and you might need to have a serial numbering for each of them maybe there's one place where there is a sale happening some another location scrapping is happening now we don't want a serial numbering to be interdependent on each other so maybe you might need to create multiple series and maintain a continuous serial numbering within each of the series so that is one important care which will be required Second important care in the invoice is the requirement of HSN and an SSE mapping. Each invoice will have to have a line level detail of HSN and the SSE codes along with the taxes plotted against it. The third important requirement in the invoice is the fact that it has to be signed. Today we have lots of documents wherein there is just a small sentence. This is a computer generated invoice, no signature is required. The government is going to issue SOCOS notices which will also be computer generated which will be digitally signed and which will debit your bank account by the penalties. So this sentence is a strict no. The law clearly says either you sign the invoice or attach a digital signature. So please make sure I understand that there are transactions where organizations have very small value invoices and bulk of invoices being created. But even in those types of, like a telecom company will have thousands and lakhs and lakhs of invoices signing each of them manually is ruled out but please ensure that you bring in a digital signature in these types of industries otherwise it's going to be fairly complex and the uh, way the law is drafted it can create a problem they have very specifically said that it has to be signed by the authorized signatory or a digital signature of that authorized signatory so please make sure that all these requirements which are mentioned and this is available everywhere so i don't want to go into individually one by one each of them but yes this is these are the contents which need to be there in the invoice. There is no specific format. So long as this minimum information is available in the tax invoice, it should be fine. Of course, a little bit of uh, excise background is continuing. So we are told that invoice has to be issued in sets. If it is a product, you will issue an invoice in a set of three. Original meant for the buyer, duplicate meant for the transporter and triplicate for the supplier. If it's service, you have to issue it in a set of two, original for the buyer and duplicate for the supplier. And this has to be prominently written on the face of the invoice. So your systems will have to be geared up, either you put a rubber stamp or you have a pre-printed thing wherein all of this is included in the appropriate fashion. When I come to pre-printed thing, this is one important thing which is coming because of GST, an important transition issue which I'll be touching upon in a few minutes. But just to touch upon that thing, that is that lots of pre-printed stationaries which you have today, might become redundant. Please check whatever stationaries you have. If it's a pre-printed stationery with all your VAT, service tax numbers, it's, it has no value. You can't print an invoice on that in the, on the 1st of July. You might need to recreate a pre-printed stationery with the GST number or in the future. So all those uh, transition cutover actions will come out, which will be relevant, especially if you are using a pre-printed document. Same way receipt voucher also has so many requirements. It is not just a small receipt which says I received a thousand rupees or two thousand rupees from you. All this content has to be there in your receipt voucher. Again it has to be serially numbered which again the number length cannot exceed 16. So all of those things you will have to be careful about in the receipt voucher. Same thing applies for bill of content, uh, bill of supply as well for exempted transactions. Mm -hmm.